Hello, everyone, and welcome to the next talk for the uh, room three, me. I am delighted to introduce uh, Tariq Barada, who is going to be talking to us about how to use maths to produce the optimal wedding seating. As somebody whose wedding is in a month from today and did maths, I'm really excited to hear this talk. Um, Tariq, where are you calling in from today? Good morning. Uh, my name is Tariq, yes. Thank you for the introduction. I'm calling from Vienna, Austria. And I'm very happy to have the opportunity of giving this talk at the Europe Heighten 2021. Well, we're delighted to have you. Um, without any further ado, I'll let you take it away. Thank you very much. So, uh, hello, I'm uh, Tariq and I'm a data scientist at Trayport, specialized on forecast and optimization models for energy markets. But uh, today I'm going to take you to a wedding. Uh, and hopefully, uh, well, as you know, we're we're like in the the eye of the storm, right between two uh, probable lockdowns. Uh, but right now, parties are allowed, and for this reason, um, we can marry. And more specifically, we look at a seating arrangement uh, problem. And you probably know if you've already been at a wedding that to preserve the peace of the wedding, you want to seat the different guests in a way um, that minimizes conflicts. And we'll see how to achieve this in Python using the uh, wonderful PyOMO optimization and modeling package. It's an open source package. And there is a notebook to this talk, uh, which is available on GitLab. There is a link here on the schedule and probably on the chat. Um, you don't have to download it now, but uh, we'll have a look later and you can look it up by yourself. So, um, you know this kind of situation, right? Uh, people invited to a wedding. Um, you've got these brothers-in-law, sister-in-law that can't really go well along with each other. You've got this weird uncle that keeps telling embarrassing joke and that you have to somehow neutralize. Um, here, we're invited at a wedding with 16 guests. So you might argue 16 guests is not a lot. Uh, but on the other hand, you probably won't be allowed to invite much more uh, in these times. And you want to allocate them onto four tables with four seats each. Each guest is characterized by a corona index. It's a number between um, minus five and plus five, which measures the opinion of a guest with respect to the corona pandemics. Um, ranging from, well, minus five would be like the absolute uh, conspirationist which, who is deeply convinced that um, corona is just an invention by big pharma and big um, Bill Gates. And on the opposite of the spectrum, you've got the total science freaks, positivists who can't wait to get their third shot of this uh, Pfizer BioNTech. And you'd like to, let's say, have rather homogeneous tables where people with relatively, well, compatible opinions sit together. The other property that you have that each guest is characterized by uh, his or her gender, for simplicity, we'll, we'll, we'll keep it binary and say that uh, females are one and, um, and males are zero. And the question is, how can we arrange the guests so that people with relatively close opinion with regard to corona sit at the same table? So for that, we'll compute a corona distance for each, uh, well, for each pair of guests, G1 and G2, we just take the difference uh, of the, the absolute value of the difference of the scores. Um, and we can display it on this uh, heat map. So it's a kind of representation you, which you've probably already seen from, from actual maps when you have the distance between two cities. The darker the cell, the higher the distance. And what you want to avoid is a situation where Sandrine Flippe and Lucius Motti, for example, would keeping arguing um, on Corona the whole evening. So we define the distance for a given table as the sum over all pairs of guests of the Corona distance. And the factor of one half here is simply to avoid counting the same pair of guests twice. So how could we solve this? Well, there is obviously a simple solution, which is to sort the guests by their Corona index and fill the tables accordingly. Um, if you do this, well, you'll see that indeed it works, um, but does it still work if we add new constraints? And which are these new constraints? Well, first, we'd like to achieve some kind of gender mix, uh, gender balance. So we want to have at least one female and one male guest per table. 
And most importantly, we've invited the Krasinski. Uh, they used to be a couple a uh, long, long time ago, um, but they're, they divorced and they hate each other, quite frankly. Um, it's not an option to not invite any one of them because um, otherwise the other one would be terribly offended. Um, but believe me, you don't want them to sit at the same table uh, because otherwise the wedding is going to be a nightmare. So we see already that by simple sorting, it doesn't work anymore. So how could we, what could we do about it? A solution would always work um, is brute force iteration. So we simply go through all the possible ways of arranging, of seating the people uh, and see whether it works or not. Well, how many combinations are there? By the power of uh, factorials, um, if you want to seat 16 people on 16 chairs, you've got roughly 21,000 billion ways of doing this. That's a big number. However, if we say that the order of the guests on a given table does not matter, uh, we've got like only 60, 63 million distinct table arrangements. So one solution would be to go through each of these 63 million table arrangements, check um, if it is a valid one in the sense that we have enough male and female per table and that the Krasinski don't sit at the same table, please not. Um, and if it's a valid arrangement, measure the corona distance uh, of this arrangement and compare it to the best one we found so far. And if it's better, then we would save this solution as the best one so far. And if we iterate through all the solutions, then eventually we'll find the best solution. So in the notebook, you can check, um, I, I, I'm making an estimate. Uh, I'm estimating the time it would take. So if we really go through the 21,000 billion combinations, redundant arrangements, this would take years. However, if we already find a way to determine this distinct arrangement, um, then it would roughly last on my laptop half an hour. So it works, but it's quite time consuming. And for this reason, um, there is actually another way of dealing this kind of problem. Uh, and it's by recognizing them as a, a so-called optimization model under constraints. What we want to do to rephrase it is to minimize the total corona distance on each table. This is something that we can call our um, objective function, subject to a certain number of constraints. And these constraints are that each guest sits at one and only one table. There are no more guests than seats on each table. There is at least one male guest at each table, at least one female guest as well. And Julius and Samantha Krasinski do not sit at the same table, no way. These are the ingredients of an optimization model. Typically, such a model consists of variables. So these are the things you do not know in advance and that you would like to optimize. Um, to find the optimal value of the decision variables. For example, uh, for a given guest and a given table, whether the guest sits at the table, yes or no. So it would be a binary decision, decision variable. You've got parameters, which are given numbers that specify your problem. Um, for example, the number of seats per table. Uh, they're known in advance, right? You've got constraints, which are equations or inequations which link variables and parameters together. You've got an objective function. Here it's our um, corona distance that we want to minimize, but you could also maximize something. And eventually there is something which is not, well, strictly speaking, necessary to, a, to an optimization model, but it's very convenient to have sets, um, sets of indices to index the other modal components on. Um, we'll see an example in, in, in a second. So it's common to express these models in a pretty standardized way um, and to pass them to a so-called optimization solver, which is a program, an external program, uh, which is capable of ingesting this standardized form. So it's basically big matrices. Uh, solve, find the optimum using some clever algorithms um, and return you the result. So here um, we're using, um, to model our program, our problem, you will be using uh, PyOMO. So it's uh, the Python, well, PyOMO probably stands for Python Optimization and Modeling Package. 
Uh, it's a wonderful package full of um, tools to solve, to, to express, to solve, um, to express optimization problems. So essentially you write down equations in math and they're turned into code um, to send the problem to a solver. And when it's solved, to collect the results and bring them back to Python. And as a solver, we're using the um, CBC coin or a solver. So BC stands for branch and cut. This is the algorithm that's uh, used for this type of, um, of, of optimization problems. Uh, and both Pyomo and CBC, the CBC solver, are currently um, hosted or, or taken care of by the coin or our uh, computational infrastructure for operations research foundation. So it's all open source. Uh, and operation research is the branch of mathematics that deals with this kind of problems. So let me walk you through um, how such a Pyomo model looks like. So here I'll show you an exemplary, very simple uh, model. It's not complete. The, the syntax is, I, I've simplified the syntax. So what you see on the screen wouldn't compile, wouldn't run. Uh, however, if you look in the notebook, uh, you'll see a, a running example. So you first define uh, an empty model, a Pyomo model, and then you can add ingredients by ingredients. You can add the sets. Um, for example, it's very convenient to have uh, tables, a set of tables, simply the name of the table, so you can you can you have a handle to them. Then you can add parameters, which may or may not be indexed on a set. For example, the table capacity, the number of chairs per table is a parameter which is indexed on the set of tables. Avocado table has four seats, etc. You can add the variables, the one that you are going to look for. And for example, one variable we'd be very interested in is this binary, this, this set of binary variables um, called guest seats at. Uh, it's indexed on the Cartesian product of guests and tables. Um, and it tells you it's binary, one or zero, and it tells you whether a given guest sits at a given table, yes or no, right? Uh, and this is what you are going to need. Well, this defines a seating arrangement, a combination of these uh, binary variables. You can add constraints, which again, may or may not be indexed on the sets you've defined previously. An obvious constraint is we want one table per guest. So each guest is assigned to one and only table. And you see that such a constraint object, well, first it's indexed on a on a sorry on a on a set, and then it contains a rule. This rule is an equation, a mathematical equation written in Python. This one tells us that if you sum the binary variables guest seats at uh, for a given guest, but if you sum it over all the table, then this must be equal to one. It's like a one-hot encoding. For a given guess, this variable uh, will be zero for all tables except at one. And this way we ensure that the guest is only assigned to one table. We add eventually the last bit of the model. The model is the objective function. The objective function is again a function, an equation. Well, it's, it's actually a relationship, an equation, um, which can be outsourced, sort of defined in a function that would return such kind of equation. So you can use all the usual Python object, um, which measures the total corona distance. So the sum of the distances of the corona distances on each table. Uh, and you have to supply the direction of the optimization. So here we want to minimize the disagreement between guests and ensure a peaceful wedding. Your model is ready to be solved. Um, you pass it to a solver. It's a handle to an actual solver program. And when it's solved by the solver, you can retrieve the values, the optimal value, meaning the values of the variables that minimize the objective function. And you can check, for example, that Julius Krasinski is sitting on the coconut table, but that Samantha Krasinski isn't, which is a great source of relief. So now we're going to switch and go to the um, notebook. So again, I said this notebook is, let me zoom a bit. I hope you can see, I hope you can see well. So I said this notebook uh, is on the, um, on should be on the, or even the chat and you can uh, also execute it if you want. 
So I'm going to quickly go through the beginning. So it's all things we've already discussed. Uh, but in the notebook, it's, it's explained in, in, in maybe more detail. Um, and come to the part where we expressed, we write down the model using Pyomo. So I won't go into the detail of all the constraints, obviously. Um, but here, at least, you see like the real syntax of Pyomo. So we declare a model. Um, we declare our sets, a set of guests, and a set of tables. We declare our parameters, some being scalar. For example, the minimum, minimal number of females per table, it's a scalar number. Uh, but we can also define uh, parameters which are indexed on, uh, on, on a set of tables, for example. The corona distance is an interesting is an interesting set because it's indexed on the cross product of guests with themselves, right? Because the distance is defined for each pair of guests uh, with some trivial results, like the fact that the distance between yourself is usually zero if, because you tend to agree with yourself. Um, but you need to declare all these sets. And we declare the variables, again, telling what set they are indexed on. Uh, and which domain they belong to, whether it's binary, it could be in some of the problems, continuous variables. Um, and here we've got two sets of variables. We've already seen the guest seats at um, set of variable, telling us whether a given guest sits on a given table. But we'll also need a second set of variables called two guest seats at, which tell us whether a given pair of guests sit at a table. I'm going to need this because of the equations which compute the distance, because the distance is always um, defined within two guests, right? And then we'll add the constraints. Um, we've already seen the constraint that we have one table associated to each guest. We have a constraint telling us that the number of guests sitting at a table might not exceed the number of chairs. We've got constraints to tell us that there should be at least um, a certain number, at least one female per table and one male. And then there is a slightly more uh, complicated constraints, which is here to define this variable two guest seat at G1 and G2. Sorry, two guest seat at a given table. So G1 and G2, the two guest seat at table T. Obviously, we would like to write down that this is the product of the binary variables telling us whether a given guest sits at a table. Um, However, this constraint is not a so-called linear constraint. It's a product of two variables. And for reasons I, I don't want to go right now into, um, we prefer to keep it linear so that the problem re remains a so-called mixed integer linear pro problem, which are uh, known to be, to be easier to solve. There is a trick for that. Um, and eventually, we write down the Krasinski exclusion principle, which makes sure that uh, Samantha Krasinski and Julius Krasinski do not sit at the same table. Eventually, we define our objective function as the total corona distance. Uh, well, we define it in two steps. First, we define for each table the total corona distance on the table, which is obtained by the uh, by summing the distance of all pairs of guests uh, using this variable to tell us whether uh, two guests the two guests sit at the table or not. So this will be, uh, the, the sum will only contain terms uh, when, when the two guests sit at the table. And we sum this over all the table. And now the stage is ready. We can pass the model to a solver and solve it. You already see that it takes some time. Um, and by the way, when you solve a model, um, you can also pass as an argument the certain time limit, which is a time up telling you, well, after, let's say, two minutes, 120 seconds, just give me uh, the best solution you found so far. And we see here that after 17 seconds, um, the solver declares that he has found, uh, that it has found an optimal solution. And the objective function, so the total corona distance for this solution, presumably optimal solution, is 29.18. We can now extract the result, the optimized values from uh, the model. And in particular, we are interested in how people see it. So let's look at this. So this is the, um, the actual result. So we see that each guest is uh, 
allocated to one given table. So here I've ordered them by table that you can check that there is for each table at least one male and one female. And you can sit that Samantha, you can check, sorry, that Samantha Krasinski is on the coconut table while Julius Krasinski is on the avocado table. So actually by, um, well, you can try to convince yourself or to, to, yeah, to, to get some feeling about whether this solution is optimal or not by, for example, looking at the um, average corona index per table, where you see that it fairly like, kind of evenly samples the space minus 5 plus 5. And if you look at the standard deviation to the dispersion of the corona index here on each table, you, feel, you, you see that it's rather narrow, so that the model tries to achieve a relatively narrow distribution of corona index per table, of course, having to, um, to do a trade-off between this um, this, this, between minimizing the corona distance, but still, uh, for example, having the Krajinskis not sitting at the same table, although uh, they have actually very similar opinions on this matter. But actually, how can you be sure that the solution is optimal? Well, it's pretty easy when you have a solution to check that it is valid. If I give you a seating arrangement, you can check easily that there is one male, one female per table, uh, and that the Krasinski do not sit at the same table. But how can you check that it's optimal? Either you can prove it mathematically, uh, but you can prove that the, that the algorithm which is implemented by the solver, so this so-called branch and cut, um, returns an optimal solution. And apart from that, well, that would be the brute force way. What you can do, it's not a proof of course, but what you can do is to collect some, let's say, anecdotal evidence. Um, well, you can try to generate at random seating arrangements, retain those who are valid, and compute their objective function, their corona distance, and check that, indeed, um, all the solutions you find have a worse, larger corona distance than the optimum. So first, let's just um, check that the optimal arrangement is a valid solution. We do kind of an independent check outside of the model, and it is. It has a distance of 29.2. And let's look at 10 random, um, 10 random seating arrangements, which are valid, and print the total corona distance. And fortunately, um, all of them are worse, and, and very often much worse, than the optimal arrangement. Of course, it's not a proof, but it suggests that it's quite hard to beat the optimum. Uh, and actually, it's not possible to beat the optimum by definition. So coming back to uh, the slides, I uh, am glad to tell you that we've reached uh, the happy end uh, of this talk. So we have found an optimal seating arrangement after roughly 10, I think this was this time it was 17 seconds on a laptop, whereas uh, by brute force iterating, iterating through all the solutions, we would have taken a uh, thousand, well, roughly half an hour, 20 minutes. So it's faster. Um, in practice, very often in real life, what happens is that you have a limited budget and time. Your boss comes into, pops up into your office and says, "I want the up, well, I want the best solution uh, within two hours, ten minutes." Um, so what you can do is to interrupt uh, the solving after a certain time up and keep the best solution so far, which very often happens to be well good enough. Um, but the cool thing about these optimization methods is that they usually give you a better solution than because you could also iterate, brute force iterate, and then solve after a given time. This would also give you a uh, best solution so far. But usually these algorithms would find a would come closer to the actual optimum or the actual optima because actually because there uh, may be different. Uh, there may be a lot of, of, of degenerate solutions, so solutions which are equally optimal. The cool thing about Pyomo um, is, is, well, Pyomo is a modeling language, right? It's, it translates math into code. Um, there are other uh, modeling languages around, but this one uh, is written in Python and it leverages on the power of Python as a programming language. You can, you can get data from Python into Pyomo, um, send to the solver, get the result back, 
process it in Pyomo. So it's it's really integrated. It's not the only one. Uh, as an alternative, I would cite Pulp, which is a very good uh, uh, alternative for, let's say, simple optimization problems, in particular, so-called mixed integer linear problems, such as the one we solved today. So actually, for what we've seen today, Pulp would have been uh, more than enough. Uh, however, I think that Pyomo has a much wider range of uh, problems it can solve, including, and here I'm just dropping names, uh, including nonlinear um, optimization and stochastic optimization. And eventually, what I'd like to, to give you as a take-home message is that many real-life situations, particularly in the industry, um, can be expressed as optimization models in logistics, uh, in economics, finance, here at Trayport, we're using these kind of techniques to optimize energy systems and energy trading. And eventually, it can be used to optimize the arrangement of the guests at your wedding. It's probably not the only thing, uh, the only issue you have to tackle at a wedding, but at least this one is solved and you can fairly uh, hope that you'll have a peaceful wedding. With this, I thank you very much for your attention. And I'd be very glad to answer your questions uh, either now, if we have some time, or at our virtual booth, um, because Trayport is a sponsor of this conference. And we'd be happy, my colleagues and, and me would be happy to answer your questions and tell you more about Trayport. Thank you very much. Fantastic. I really, really enjoyed that. Um, thank you so much. Uh, I'll have to uh, adopt some of that methodology for planning my uh, my seating plan. We do have a question from the chat um, from Fabian. And Fabian asks, have you experimented with how many guests the model solver can deal with or how those unlinked constraints of, for example, divorced guys influence mm -hmm. running times if there were more of those? Um, thank you for the question. Uh, I didn't experiment systematically, but what we could say is that um, if you look at the brute force way, or simply the, if you look at the number of combinations they are, uh, it scales very badly. Um, I think like it's even worse than exponential. Um, so if you're looking at, uh, let's say the number of arrangements, uh, assuming that you have a certain number of guests per table and uh, which is constant, but you increase the number of tables, it will, well, if I didn't do anything wrong with the math, it's like, uh, m to the power number of tables to the power of number of tables, so probably something like exponential. Um, so brute force iteration scales really badly. How about the branch and cut algorithm? Um, and well, I couldn't really give you a, a, a definitive answer. As far as I understand, there can always be pathological cases where it scales uh, also really badly, but in practice, it's much faster in, in a lot of real cases, but still for these kind of problems, even with branch and cut, uh, even increasing, well, if, if you double the number of, of table, for example, you've got, you've got 10 to the 16 times more arrangements. So um, even in this case, branch and cut wouldn't help you that much, to be honest. All right, thank you, very comprehensive answer. <laughs> I Ah, oh, we have another question. Um, oh. Can Pyomo be used with a different solver than Coin or CBC? Is yes, there one you yes. recommend? Um, okay, so uh, yes, Pyomo is uh, can be used with any well, all the standard solvers. So if, uh, there are commercial software solvers which like Groby or um, Cplex, which is very powerful but commercial. Um, CBC is a very good open source, uh, the best open source solver I know. I'm aware of. Uh, so I would re definitely recommend using this one unless you're limited. Otherwise, if you have a big problem that you can't solve on your computer, what you can do is to use remote infrastructure. There is a um, the NEOS program hosted by, uh, I think, universities across the world. Uh, it's also compatible with Pyomo. You just need an internet connection. It sends your problem through the internet and you get back the uh, solution. So it's for like one shot experiments, it's good. Uh, you wouldn't use it for your startup. Excellent. Uh, we have another question. Uh, it looks like you really need to know the underlying data structures for defining constraints uh, with the need to support create supporting intermediate data structures. Uh, do you know about a collection of common constraining patterns uh, to make this easier? Hmm, I'm not sure I, I, I get the question. So 
Um, well, in my understanding, you, you need to really well define, yes, you, you need to know everything. You really set right down the equations. So you need to, to have a pretty clear idea of the, of the data you're working with. Um, of course, like in which kind of Python data structure the data is, doesn't really matter. You just put it then in the end in more or less dictionaries. Uh, but I guess this is not really what you're asking for. So My interpretation of this question is that exactly, uh, yeah. how, how far that. do you need to understand the maths behind it in order to be able to use Pyomo effectively? Um, and mm -hmm. as I, my my guess would be, you do you do need to know some of the of the theory fairly solidly. That's true. Yeah, that's true. You need to write down the equations by yourself. Hopefully, you can also get some inspiration from existing models on the let's say Pyomo gallery on on GitLab or uh, uh, books, etc. All right, I think that's uh, all of the questions we had from the chat and we are at time. Thank you so much, Tariq. That was a Thank you very much. Talk. And uh, well, happy wedding. <laughs> Thank you.